Hey everybody, this is Martin Steed, and I am welcoming you to Sunday Stories, where stories from authors, and today I'm so proud to have the great author of a phenomenal book. For all of you who haven't purchased it, you need to get it. It's a guide post to the soul of who you might be just because Miles has taken the time, and this is Miles Marshall Lewis which is uh, such a powerful name just to start before you write. <laughs> what, what, what was going on when, when the name came out? <laughs> Respect, man. A lot of stuff, man. You know, there was a lot of things in the air in 1970. But uh, my dad, he named me after Miles Davis. But then the Marshall, it was uh, the middle name of uh, Jimi Hendrix. You know, my dad saw him in concert a few times and was a fan of both those legends. So, yeah. <laughs> Now, and, and obviously for your brother, I'm thinking there was so such a huge, you know, Thurgood Marshall. Now I know the Jimi Hendrix middle name, which I've lived all these years and never known what it was. And all of a sudden the brother gives it to me. So I got another gym. Uh, and, and those are the stories of Sunday Story. It is really to unravel. And this book is uh, so powerful. I mean, it literally allows uh, a lens that isn't jaded by just hip hop. Um, why did you choose that approach? And what do you want individuals to be able to, what stories do you want them to be able to tell after they've read this powerful um, canon of work? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, interesting question. You know, covering Kendrick Lamar, I didn't want it just to be a straight up biography uh, where you learn about his life from beginning to end. And then in the center of it, there's some photographs of Kendrick and people close to him. Like that's a traditional way to do it. But uh, Kendrick is such a creative artist, uh, in my opinion. And like, I felt like it needed something extra. It, you know, the book itself needed to be uh, on the same creative vibe as uh, his output of work, you know? So um, we got some illustrators in there uh, to sort of draw designs and um, illustrate the book in a way that might be familiar to people from something like Jay-Z's memoir, Decoded, you know, which was full of photographs and illustrations. Uh, this book is, is sort of on that wavelength. And um, I, I didn't want to just tell his biography like a Wikipedia entry, you know what I mean? So whenever I could, I sort of uh, went into his life story with my own stories, you know, uh, as a storyteller, Kendrick is phenomenal. And I figured a book of stories would be the accurate way to, uh, uh document his genius, you know? So that's really, uh, the bottom line behind the approach that I took to the book. Um, what stories do I want people to take away from it? Well, you know, they should know his, his biography from the A to Z. I mean, despite, uh, the amount of stories that I tell in it, they're all connected to Kendrick and his biography. And, um, you know, you should be familiar that uh, Damn, uh, his last studio album, won the Pulitzer Prize for music, you know? Uh, you should be familiar with the story of how he met, first met Dr. Dre, for example, uh, whose Aftermath Entertainment he signed with, with the Good Kid, Mad City album. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Like uh, Kendrick is my favorite hip hop artist of the modern era. And it was my pleasure to, to get down with him, uh, you know, in this fashion, uh, documenting his life with this book. So when you think about that as a storyteller and author, for many of the individuals who will be coming behind you, looking at your canon and what you've literally uh, put together. And I, I wanna say to anybody watching, he is being very, very gentle about his, his genius, Miles' genius. What's complimentary is to see a black writer take apart black genius and still include the community and a movement. There's a movement in this book that mm -hmm. is so wrenching. It actually rivets you when you read um, the way you intersect his journey but also the journey of how music and influence affects both artists and community. Can you share uh, why you use that approach? Sure, I mean, I'm a lifelong Prince fan. You know, uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing him before he passed away. And uh, growing up with my parents, my, both of them were 
huge music lovers. And when I was really enamored with like the Purple Rain album, for example, you know, when it first came out, the movie and everything, uh, my father immediately was like, you know, well, if you love Prince, you know, here, you need to listen to like Sly and the Family Stone's greatest hits. And there's a riot going on, which I uh, wrote a book about incidentally also. And, you know, you need to hear Jimi Hendrix, uh, Electric Ladyland. And, you know, he would lay these records on me immediately so that I could see the continuum that Prince was a part of. And I felt that that was uh, something necessary to give to the mainly youth, you know, who are really into uh, Kendrick stuff. So uh, I made sure that you understood that uh, even though Kendrick has done concept albums like Damn and To Pimp a Butterfly, that actually Marvin Gaye uh, created the sole concept album practically with what's going on, you know, in 1971. And uh, the there's just a continuum, you know, uh, that Kendrick's a part of that goes back to uh, the legacy of black music that stretches back uh, to the earliest parts of the 20th century. What I loved about this book in terms of uh, emotion was you connected it almost felt like a family reunion for those who appreciate blackness, for those who were looking, particularly in a moment where we're literally trapped to some degree in COVID, can't literally get in, the, in a room and just be with a stranger. You literally in these new bubbles. This is such a huge family reunion of understanding our community and movements. When you say Sly and the Family Stones. What does Sly mean to you? And what did you find those stories being that complemented Hendrick's growth? Mm, good question. I mean, Sly, I had the pleasure of seeing him as well in concert. But it wasn't quite the same experience as my father seeing him like 40 years ago. Uh, but I, I saw him maybe 10 years ago uh, in Paris when he was touring with uh, his daughter. Um, you know, she had put together the family stone, you know, of new players. Uh, but Sly, uh, what he means to me is, well, I consider him a forefather of funk, you know, if not the inventor of funk. I mean, between him and James Brown and, and George Clinton, it's like a Mount Rushmore of, uh, of funk music, you know. And uh, in terms of how much I love Prince, uh, Sly was definitely on that same vibe, but like the originator of it in terms of uh, having uh, a backing band that was like male and female and black and white, like, you know, Prince replicated that with the revolution with uh, the 1999 album and Purple Rain Ar around the world in a day. But Sly, that was Sly and the Family Stone in a nutshell. You know, he had all these these cool musicians that, uh, you know, were challenging things uh, in the 1960s in terms of, uh, you know, black, white, uh, male, female, you know, in, in creating rock music for that matter, because Sly pay, played Woodstock, you know, like that's a big deal. Uh, you know, just like Hendrix played Woodstock, you know, so my father named me after, you know, the two black men who were at Woodstock. <laughs> Richie Havens was also there, you know, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, that was important to me to convey, you know, again, I feel like uh, Kendrick's audience is mainly the youth and the youth may not know these stories, you know, so at this point, uh, as a curator of Black culture myself, you know, it's, it's sort of my responsibility to make sure that uh, I slip some vegetables in, you know, with the, <laughs> with the rest, the, the sweet stuff, you know. Uh, but I, I, I think what I found, and well, I know what I found when I began to both read and sample, because um, I had to reread your work. I love, love the, the storytelling that you do. I had to reread. Right. I had to come back and find those intersections, but there's a huge intersection in your storytelling about how, if you haven't got it, you're now gonna end up with at least one more tool on how to look at both life as mm. a black young person mm. and the fact that there's an intersection with the intentionality of how Kindred approach. So here's an award show that just could have been he was at the award show. He got the most nominations. Bye, bye, bye. This means nothing. Instead, you chose a different approach. Why? And what should those people know that you're telling the story about him that you want them to pause and understand that you're just not an award winner in this life? You're here to be a change agent. Sure. I mean, I, I believe the award show you're talking about is probably the Grammy Awards, where he uh, got nominated for the most amount of Grammys, uh, second to like Michael Jackson at some point, you know, for uh, his album, uh, Good Kid, Mad City, or maybe it was To Pimp a Butterfly. I think that was To Pimp a Butterfly. But 
be that as it may, uh, he came on stage and he was dressed like a prisoner and, it, you know, like uh, shackled and he, he performed a certain part, you know, a certain song. He went to the next one and then he was sort of free and there were like African dancers behind him and he performed another part. Then he did a freestyle uh, and, you know, somewhere in there he did All Right, which uh, is a song from To Pimp a Butterfly that was uh, adopted by the Black Lives Matter movement, you know. So it was important to get like the con the full context, really, of what his performance meant and how important it is. You know, years later, he won uh, the Pulitzer Prize for Damn, which no uh, musician outside of the jazz and classical music realm had ever won that award. And that includes any R&B album, any R&B great you could think of, like Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, you know, like none of these people. Uh, Duke Ellington was nominated for it once and, and they decided not to give it to him. Uh, which was definitely unfair and, and sort of racist on their behalf. But uh, Kendrick won it. And uh, I had to give the backstory and explain, well, OK, he won it. But on top of that, this is really the importance of it. You know, um, from maybe 2004 to 2011, I lived in Paris, France. Right. Uh, I'm from the Bronx, which is as hard scrabble an area as uh, Kendrick's Compton. And, uh, and I moved to France for seven years, uh, married my wife there, my kids were born there. And it was a life-changing experience. And I felt like uh, I could relate to uh, Kendrick's experience going to Africa. He had visited uh, the motherland, uh, going to uh, Cape Town uh, for the first time. He had never been to Africa and he uh, went and it, it blew his mind. Uh, he went to Johannesburg, he went to Cape Town. Uh, he went to uh, see uh, where uh, Nelson Mandela was locked up, actually, Robin Island, you know, and uh, and it changed his life uh, to the point where he, he incorporated a lot of that stuff uh, when he was the curator of the Black Panther soundtrack and also on To Pimp a Butterfly. So, uh, you know, it's important to share to the youth uh, the importance of uh, of going abroad, you know, and of seeing like having a worldwide perspective. And, uh, you know, not, I mean, uh, getting off the block, needless to say, but also just outside of your city, outside of your country, you know, like uh, it's, it's a huge world. And uh, taking for granted the power of the American passport to be able to go nearly everywhere, you know. You know, um, it's funny you say for the youth, but I think this is for is, is an intergenerational canon. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't want people to look at this book, nor do I want them to not see the ideas that you are collaborating with. This, this is your namesake. You're, Indeed. You're, you're giving O to a lot and, and it's an intergenerational family conversation. The family can read this book together and take a part. Um, you've got what I hope um, we will find that people take this canon an approach and you've given them a passport when you use this to kind of say, here's how things have unraveled. And maybe you haven't been served this flavor. So I'm going to give you this flavor of music in a different way. I, I really love that you said that. But then all of a sudden I feel like James Baldwin is, is hanging out or, and, and, and I'm not your, you know, Negro. I, I'm, and, and you're saying this out loud, but in a musicality kind of way, um, what has been this passport of truth that you kind of received and placed in this for people to say, hey, there's a movement asunder. If you love Kendrick, you've got to love this black movement. Yeah, well, I, as I mentioned, you know, All Right was sort of adopted by the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, Kendrick himself has sort of been canonized as someone who's really like a, a young black voice who's very, uh, uh, Important, certainly, but uh, tantamount to other Black voices like uh, James Baldwin or like ta Coates, but like you say, on a musical level, you know? And uh, we've had those kind of prophets in the past, uh, musical geniuses like Bob Marley, you know, like Fela Kuti, you know, like Nina Simone, uh, like Curtis Mayfield, you know? And uh, Kendrick doesn't do this all the time. He definitely produces his share of party music, you know, because you gotta, you gotta get the listeners' attention, you know, before you you feed them some information. You know, Public Enemy, uh, the rap group from the 1980s did the same thing. You know, I mean, they're still together, but they had their heyday in the 80s. And uh, rappers I grew up with when I was in college or senior year of high school, like KRS-One, Rakim, you know, those were all, uh, you know, they were all part of this golden age of hip hop when hip hop was like a social movement. 
you know, uh, and a youth movement, certainly, but like it's going beyond that at this point when Jay Z is 51 years old and, you know, one of the, the few uh, billionaires that was able to, uh, people that was able to become a billionaire from hip hop and from his roots in hip hop. So, uh, so yeah, it's just, it's important to uh, illustrate that Kendrick is part of a new movement, you know, where Black Lives Matter is, is uh, the latest, greatest version of the civil rights movement and, and different uh, liberation movements uh, of African-Americans in the past. So for those who are looking for story, you even come to the point where you're talking about DNA. What, how do you describe, for those who have it without giving everything away, why DNA is a chapter? What do we really need to know about our own musical Black DNA? Right. Well, you know, I chose all of the song t uh, chapter titles in the book uh, from Kendrick's song titles, you know. So DNA is one of my favorite songs of his, but it made sense for that chapter because I was explaining what uh, specifically Kendrick's DNA is as a musical artist and who he drew from, you know, whether it was Tupac or it was uh, Marvin Gaye, a little something, you know, or uh, just every, everybody that sort of influenced him, you know. Uh, but, you know, what can I say about the, the glorious legacy of African-American music in general? I mean, uh, hip hop is famous for sampling bits of what came before, you know, back to good times, uh, you know, Sheik's good times being taken for Rapper's Delight, you know, which was the first rap hit. But, uh, you know, d taping the best beats of James Brown, you know, for a lot of the things that were done in the 80s by uh, artists like EPMD and anybody you can name really uh, sample James Brown during, during a certain amount of years, you know. Uh, I think curiosity is really a very important element uh, that needs to be considered because you need to be uh, musically curious to go back to see what the Four Bears did. I mean, um, back to the jazz greats, you know, back to the blues greats, you know, like all of this stuff, all this information is here and it's at your fingertips. Like everybody in their back pocket has like, two billion songs, you know, in their music, uh, in their phone device, you know, and uh, doesn't really take anything to access YouTube or Spotify or whatever and, and go back and listen to what Muddy, Muddy Waters sounded like, you know, go back mm -hmm. to listen to, to all the great stuff uh, that came, you know, out of uh, Duke Ellington and, and like, uh, you know, Cab Calloway, let's say, but like, uh, they all had dope stuff, you know, Chuck Berry, it was all, it was all great. And, uh, you know, Kendrick is not divorced from that. Kendrick is in that line. So when you say that, can you kind of share with us what it's like to be a black man writing black stories for black people in Paris? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, you know, talking about influence and DNA, like definitely James Baldwin was a heavy part of my DNA, made me want to become a writer. And I knew that he lived over there. Maya Angelou, props to her. You know, she was a world traveler who spent some time there. And I was heavily influenced as a teenager by all her memoirs. She's got like four or five memoirs because her life was so rich, you know. And uh, it set the template for me in terms of like, okay, so this is what a writer is. What are, you know, like they experience things and then they talk about what they experienced, you know, uh, on an intellectual level, let's say, or, you know, in a way that uh, is relatable to everyone and, and inspiring for that matter, you know, because without the direct inspiration of people like Maya Angelou and Baldwin, I, I might not have become a writer at all, you know? So uh, while I was there, you know, and, and then there are the white folks too, the beat movement and stuff like that, Jack Kerouac and Ginsburg, they were over there and I appreciated what they did, but Hemingway never had the effect on me personally that James Baldwin did. I've read everything he's written. And uh, during the time I was there, uh, as uh, in my thirties, let's say, so as a young black man, uh, I definitely made uh, my point to do my own spin on, on what Baldwin uh, did in terms of the essays that he produced while he was there. I knew that I was in a new millennium. I was uh, in like the 2010s. And so uh, doing a blog made sense to me, you know, whereas uh, that's not something that existed in his time, you know, and I uh, was sharing worldwide uh, my experiences of seeing different concerts and having different experiences over there and what racism is like over there. It's not non-existent by any means. And uh, that Paris is not a utopia the way it's sometimes sold. And, uh, you know, just making sure that uh, from a young man's perspective, you know, like I had Skype, 
You know what I mean? That's not something that existed for the expatriates from back in the day. You know, I didn't have to go to the American Express office and get my traveler's checks. You know, like uh, I had an ATM card and my pops would deposit money. and I'd take it out over there, you know, so it was like a new world. And I felt like it needed to be documented. Uh, the, the expatriate experience as a black man needed to be documented in, in a 21st century fashion. So thanks for that. Your process. How did you approach writing this book? Um, did you ever have any block? What was the most inspiring aspects of, you know, writing this book for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I can't say that there were any blocks. I think I probably used the same process as I did putting together the Sly Stone book that I bought. You know, a certain amount of research happens for a certain amount of months. Uh, definitely there's combing through all the interviews that I uh, that he's done, you know, which are all available on the internet. Research is a lot easier these days with, with the help of Google, you know, speaking about Baldwin, he had to go to his library and, and go on microfiche, you know, to uh, research certain things. But uh, I was able to go on Google, watch a certain amount of YouTube interviews and performances of his, uh, research the um, interviews he'd done, uh, uh, like print interviews on different websites. And definitely I did hit the library and, and go back to like old double XL magazines uh, where I was once the deputy editor uh, of that magazine, but to go back and see uh, the interviews uh, in print that were done. And uh, I had interviewed Kendrick actually in 2015, uh, again, during the Tepimpa Butterfly era, I interviewed him and I used my own interview uh, of, with him throughout the book, uh, you know, just to, sort of sprinkle it with some insights that he'd shared with me during uh, our few hours together. So, uh, so all of that was, was in the mix, you know? Um, but I mean, writing for me, is just a labor of love. Uh, you know, w when I was uh, even a, a tweener in, in junior high, I was writing letters to comic books and like Marvel comics would publish my fan letters and stuff. And I would bring it to school, you know, and show like kids in my class and stuff, you know? So it's, it's uh it's just a good time to me, you know, <laughs> like writing is definitely a headache from time to time, but uh, for the most part, it's just something I enjoy doing and, and bringing it to the folks. Well, writing about a, a black man, which is very different. Like you, you've taken the, uh, you know, here's one sage and, and, and like a, a, a king would call someone to entomb and, and give him an idea. And maybe it would be inside a pyramid if there was this Kendrick uh, Lamar pyramid and, and we were going to all go inside and, and build some shrine. You've done that in this canon, in this book. Um, when you're at, and if you were at Howard or Morehouse, and you were going to kind of challenge these young people, what would the title of your graduation into life Obviously, it's just another movement. What would mm -hmm. your graduation speech be? And what would you challenge them to, to look at, the three chapters in this book, that they should look at as they move out the door into life? Mm. That's an excellent question. I'd, I'd have to think about that. I mean, definitely DNA would probably be one of them because I, I feel like DNA, yeah, I explain how Kendrick drew on uh, Marvin Gaye and, and drew on... Um, the different people, Tupac, Shakur, Jay-Z, you know, came before him. But I think that that's true for all of us, you know, even beyond our own parents that, uh, which is obvious, our grandparents, family, uh, that this, this influences on us, you know, and uh, that there are people even that we can use as lodestars, you know, for our own direction uh, that influence us and inspire us, you know. I think inspiration is, is very, very important uh, because, without the examples of, of certain people that came before me, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I, th I think that's true for loads and loads of, of successful black folks out there, you know, or people period, you know? Um, so I'd say that, I'd say that. Uh, two other chapters in the book, hmm, let me think. I like the last chapter. The last chapter deals with uh, how, like the literary value of Kendrick's work. You know, and I got uh, some outside commentary in that chapter from ta Coates and uh, Alicia Garza. Uh, no, I don't think she's in that chapter. I think uh, Aja Monet is in that chapter, who is an excellent, excellent poet. Uh, and I needed her to, uh, commentary to break down the poetic side of, uh, of Kendrick's uh, output, you know. But I think that, um, you know, that's just that's an important chapter because, uh, 
you need to realize that there's there's more going on than just uh, you know the rhyme schemes. I mean, like the poetic level of of his stuff is just uh, on another level. It's no accident that Maya Angelou did a guest spot on um, on one of his albums, uh, "Good Kid, Mad City." You know, playing like a pre a, a street side preacher who sort of baptized him on the spot in front of a supermarket. You know, uh, before she passed away. Uh, rest in peace, Maya Angelou. You know. Um, a third chapter I, I, I doesn't jump to mind, you know, at the moment, but I would definitely present that to the youth, you know, if I had to do like a, a commencement address someplace, uh, like my alma mater, Morehouse. No, our alma mater. But, uh, and it, I, it, respect. It, yeah. <laughs> it was the, uh, now, I wanted to say that because intellectually, you forge this place for people, and it's a reservoir. It's a reservoir of Kendrick, but even to kind of talk about a Pulitzer Prize, literally, you're saying to people, this prize exists because, mm -hmm. and you probably, like most individuals, if you hadn't put this lens on it, it really wasn't available to Blacks until recently. So this institutional discrimination lasted beyond Prince's genius, who could have gotten it, beyond Marvin Gaye's genius, who should have gotten it. But you're literally kind of saying, okay, the door is now open. Now, is everybody else going to kick this door down and be serious about the work? Is that the question you're posing this generation by letting them know it's possible for them to know that they can be recognized and should be recognized? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, this uh, passage in the book where I talk about when um, Kendrick met Obama, you know, at the White House uh, for the My Brother's Keeper initiative that happened uh, during uh, probably uh, Obama's second term as president. And similarly to Obama being the first Black president and inspiring so many uh, with the beautiful Black family that was up in the White House, uh, you know, Michelle and the kids and, and Bo the dog and the whole nine, you know, and never having a scandal during the eight years that he was in office and always being, uh, you know, super presidential and just... Uh, you know, that, the height of Black excellence and, and Black cool, even some would say, some have argued, you know. Uh, Kendrick, similarly, you know, it's like for Kendrick to win the Pulitzer Prize and be from Compton and, and do the things that he's done, braiding his hair and wearing hoodies and jeans and just, you know, not doing it uh, in the fashion that you might have thought you needed to present in order to get the Pulitzer. Like, you know, a rap artist winning a Pulitzer Prize for music is just, uh, insane and, and unheard of and, and inspirational. And, uh, you know, I just, I wanted to dive, do a deep dive into it to make sure that he had his full props and that we attack it from all angles so you understand the significance of it. For somebody watching, and, and I want to say this is a phenomenal project for all of you who haven't had the opportunity, go to blackbookstore.com or at least go to any black bookstore because black uh, commerce us being able to support others in our community is very important, but should you choose buy it wherever so we can support his genius? That's Miles' genius in addition. You amplify giants. You've interviewed giants. Um, giants. What are three characteristics in, in your storytelling all giants possess? Uh, well, I would say they, they're good listeners, actually. You know, I think that they're sponges for information and that uh, they use that information and they filter it through their own genius to produce something brand new. You know, we saw that with Prince, you know, doing uh, not his version of Sly Stone and Hendrix per se, but just filtering all those influences, you know, um, from the people that came before him. Um, I think that they have tenacity, you know, let's say they, they, they have a certain amount of stick to itiveness, you know, um, and uh, as well, uh, well, I think Quincy Jones actually called it ass power. You know, like your ability to sit your behind in a chair and not move until the project is done. You know, uh, going back to Prince, he would create like a song a day. And sometimes it would take him 18 hours to do that. But he didn't want to crash. He didn't want to go to sleep until the song was done. You know, like you have to have a certain amount of tenacity, uh, you know, and drive uh, like that. You know, you got to be a good listener, you know, a good sponge. And uh, what else? I, you know, I think that, you sort of have to like see listen to the people around you you know like no man is an island you know i think that uh in i mean not just on the influence level but just uh a certain amount of console you know from people in terms of them telling you 
you know, what's good and what's bad. I mean, Barack Obama was a great statesman, great politician, but he had his board of advisors, you know, and I think that everybody sort of needs their own personal board of advisors in terms of people to bounce ideas off of. No one does it alone, you know, and like uh, even this book that I've created, I lean heavily on uh, the genius of, of my uh, illustrator and designer, uh, Jabola up in Canada, a brother up in Canada who uh, definitely laid down the pen and, and chose the photographs that appear in the book, you know, with me, we went back and forth and stuff like uh, the book is not great because of me alone. So share that collaboration. Um, for many people, they've never collaborated with an illustrator to tell a story. They've never collaborated with a Tadahachi Coates and actually just kind of just, bro, here's what I'm doing. What are those conversations like as these black creators, genius creators, share genius and love enough on this project that you end up with something this great and allow the community to, once again, I think it's a passport to freedom. Like if you mm. haven't read this book, I promise you that I'll sing about me. They'll sing, you'll sing about me. I'm singing about you, Miles. This is a <laughs> dope Thank book. You. It Thank literally you. gives people agency. I feel like I got new agency about not only myself, but about the fact that there was a black man who wanted to give me a passport to travel to a place that I may not, if you hadn't done it, taken myself. What's yeah. it like that to collaborate with others and the, particularly those individuals that you have and, and produce this work? Sure. Yeah. No, I think a, a collaboration is essential. I mean, I think that they all brought their own uh, passion to the project as well. You know, I approach people who, uh, however critical they may have been and Criticism is important and being critical and being an independent thinker is definitely, uh, you know, uh, important. But uh, they all loved in Kendrick and they all had a certain amount of passion for the project, uh, a passion that equaled mine, you know. So collaborating with them all was, was really sort of a seamless process, you know, but calling them up and bouncing around ideas and, and, and making the choices for different things. Uh, it reminds me of my work as an editor, you know, in general. I mean, I've, I've been an editor at BET and Vibe Magazine, Double XL Magazine, uh, Ebony Magazine, and, you know, in addition to uh, being an author and a writer and, and all of that, like uh, being an editor was always an important thing to me to refine young voices uh, work that would come into me and we would go line by line through their stuff to make them great. Like, you know, being an editor, uh, uh, it, it entailed like calling people and making sure that, you know, their stuff was tight and, um, and, and taking people whose work I really respected and words I respected. The, making this book was the same thing, you know, like when I was like, okay, so who would get to the heart of the literary value of his work? Well, that's Ta-Nehisi Coates, you know, like if he would do it for me, you know, great. And I called him and he, he was only happy to, you know, uh, the different other people that I, uh, got within the book. Greg Tate actually was a writer that I came up with uh, who was writing in the Village Voice when I was in high school and, and inspired me. And I was uh, definitely making sure that, you know, his uh, his knowledge was, was reflected and uh, his take on Kendrick too. You know, it's like, uh, it brings more variety to the book. In fact, you know, to, to have more voices in it in general, other than just mine. So we've never been, most people have never spoken to giants. So when you approach them, you did what? Because they, they've never heard. How do you approach someone? Because most people don't get to have conversations, even though um, for his genius, uh, Brother Coates does make his self and ideas known, which I, I've always admired. But with the two of you, how would you mm -hmm. describe him as a personality if you wrote mm -hmm. a book about him? Um, uh -huh. and, and, and why is he a kindred spirit, if I will, that you <laughs> connected to? Right. No, good question. You know, uh, Tanahasi uh, is someone where I guess we, uh, he's a little bit younger than I am, you know, but we would read each other definitely throughout the, the 1990s, the O's, the Audis, let's say, you know, uh, we were familiar with each other's writing already and just had never met or spoken, you know, uh, outside of social media and barely even there. So when I approached him cold uh, to be a part of this book, uh, he did make it clear that he was familiar with my work with uh, my first cover story where I, in the Source magazine, where I covered the breakup of A Tribe Called Quest, for example. Uh, you know, if A Tribe Called Met Quest meant anything to you, and they did to thousands and thousands of us, you know, uh, 
you read my story because you were shocked that they'd broken up. You know, there was no Twitter back in 1998 where you already knew they broke up and they explained it themselves. Like you had to get the magazine that had my interview in it, you know? So he, he knew me from that and from other things I've done. And, and definitely I followed his career and I'm very happy for Between the World and Me and, and the other great work that he's done. And, uh, and I do consider him a great, you know, and uh, approaching him though was, was, uh, was not really the hardest thing in the world. He's just a busy man. So I was glad that uh, he made the time to to email me some comments on uh, on Kendrick and how he felt about him. You know, I do agree that he's a he's a Kendrick spirit. Yeah. Um, no, I like it. This this is kind of the last because you've told some great stories, but I do want you to share two last stories with me, if you would. One yeah. is um, interviewing Kendrick. What it was like when you were in the room for somebody that hasn't been there and you're mm-hmm. touching that. And what are the best and favorite stories that your dad ever shared with you about music? <laughs> <That's deep. laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, in terms of Kendrick, uh, we met twice in the photo studio where Ebony magazine was photographing his cover story. And then uh, in the studio, and he's a workaholic. He's a Gemini, like Prince and uh, like Miles Davis, for that matter. And so uh, I had heard about that, uh, you know, heard about that about him uh, beforehand. And when I left him, he was in the studio and he was probably there until six in the morning, you know, doing his thing. But uh, he, he was a low key brother. Uh, I feel like. Um, he was giving of himself, you know what I mean? I feel like he was very forthcoming and forthright, despite the fact that he wanted to get back to what he was doing. He sat with me and he was present and uh, spoke to him about his meditation practices and stuff in terms of uh, respecting the power of now and, and uh, the present moment. And, uh, and he, he gave what he had, you know, uh, in terms of conversationally and uh, he didn't shy away from anything uh, that was, nothing really on the table, off the table that I wasn't allowed to, to rap with him about. Uh, in terms of my father, I mean, one of the greatest stories he ever told me was about uh, the Harlem Cultural Festival. You know, uh, brother Questlove directed a movie this summer uh, called Summer of Soul about um, this amazing uh, concert that happened six months before Woodstock that had Nina Simone and Sly Stone and different people, uh, David Ruffin and uh, Mahalia Jackson. And uh, my father went to that show my father was like maybe 19 at the time, or not even, probably 18, and uh, had been to that show and uh, is in the Questlove movie as like a talking head. You know, my dad had never done anything like that before and was approached because it came to his attention, uh, came to the producer's attention that my father had been in, to the show. And uh, But I've been hearing about that show for like the past 30 years, my dad, you know. Uh, it would, you know, inform me a lot about it. And uh, as, a, as a big Sly fan, as a big Temptations fan, David Ruffin was there. Uh, you know, it was just this amazing unsung thing where the average person had never even known that this thing happened. So I'm glad for that, that movie, uh, Summer of Soul, exists now. And uh, definitely, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's one of the, the great unsung stories of African-American music. Well, everybody, we've been having Sunday Story with... Um phenomenal miles marshall lewis uh promise that you will sing about me um buy it share it um make sure that you uh, say uh that his name because i think that uh you put together quite a, a beautiful uh, movement in its own to allow us to use kendrick as a way to reflect on us. So I just want to thank you. Uh, you can go to blackbookstore.com, pick it yeah. up. I appreciate all your kind words, man. You know, thank you for, for the time. You know, this was uh, very One thing you'll know about me, if, if I didn't believe that it was there, I, I do a lot of interviews, I wouldn't say it. Um, if I didn't believe that there was something for people to take away that would be more than the price of this book, I wouldn't say it. Uh, um, yeah. You know, so for me, I, I didn't know that you'd gone to Morehouse but I did know that you gave me a gift when I had and was able to read this book. So thank you so much, much right. appreciated. Everybody, this is Monty Steed on Sunday Stories, and I am definitely with Miles, which is a big name, and um, Marshall, which is huge, Jimi Hendrix's middle name, and Thurgood Marshall, 
who's part of the Freedom uh, First Black Supreme Court Justice in Lewis. Obviously, Miles is getting in good trouble, so there's lots there for us to recognize. And obviously, uh, we appreciate you, your dad, and the legacy of the family that you had, and appreciate all that you continue to give us culturally as an iconic uh, person handling the canon of Black existence and Black history. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Continuous success. Peace. Peace.